Welcome back to another episode of See You on the Other Side. I am your co-host, Christine, and I am here with Leah. And we are also with Del Jolly today. Um, Del Jolly, I feel like you are the jack of all trades. Um, so you're the co-founder of Unlimited Sciences. Um, you were a part of Decriminalize Denver, and you are a creator of Umbo. Yes. Yep, Welcome. Those are uh, lots of the things <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm up to. So thank you for the intro. You're welcome. Um, so, yeah, tell us, uh, I guess we'll get started with Unlimited Sciences. Tell us what Unlimited Sciences is. Yeah, Unlimited Sciences is a psychedelic research nonprofit uh, using real world community data to uh, then serve the community. We've We've been working with Johns Hopkins for three years and trying to understand uh, what everybody talks about so much set and setting. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in the community of psilocybin users, they, they know how to use these things. They don't necessarily need to sit on a couch at Johns Hopkins. And what is the information that we could get from them to help people who are going to, you know, at the end of the day, take their health in their own hands, do psilocybin on their own. How can we utilize the information that they have to then serve it back to the community and say, hey, look, you know, if you're going to use this substance, here's some here's some good guidelines or at least some statistical data that we've pulled from Johns Hopkins on on how to uh, maybe approach this if, if it's your first time. So that is that is one of the studies. That's our first study that we started with. But we also just uh, are in the middle. We've we've wrapped up the actual event, but we also did a, um, ayahuasca study with mostly female Arab refugees. And, uh, we were invited to observe this from a a dear friend of ours who uh, is from Saudi. And so we're kind of analyzing this data and how that community uses ayahuasca. We always hear about, you know, quite honestly, bunch of white people in LA using ayahuasca, right? Or maybe traveling down to South America, but it's typically, you know, English speaking folks who have a Western culture. Well, how does that affect, you know, people from Saudi, right? Mm. That's, that's a, that's a whole different uh, animal. So we're in the middle of kind of completing that study as well, but, you know, Unlimited Sciences is a uh, psychedelic research nonprofit for the people by the people. That's what we'll say. I found it interesting that you guys have this, um, I wanted to participate in it. Like you can join and help in the, the data that you guys collect by reaching out if you plan on having a psilocybin journey. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a clinical setting, right? Well, yeah. And so, so just for clarity, uh, we started this study in 2019 and we actually just ended it. So we had over 8,000 people enroll in our study. Wow. Uh, that's amazing. And yeah. And it's, it's, uh, so how, how that looks is, uh, folks come in and, um, they say, Hey, this is how I'm going to use this substance. And then they, um, I'm sorry guys, there's a trash truck that's going to come by here. <laughs> it's it's like- going to be super loud for a second. <laughs> So, so the way that this study worked is, uh, you know, you obviously learn about it and then you enroll in the study and, and uh, we send a series of surveys. This is called uh, prospective observational uh, research, longitudinal too, because we're, we're doing a longer time period. So you enroll in the study two weeks before your intended sit. And it's a pretty intense, uh, about an hour and a half uh, um, set of surveys childhood trauma, a lot, a lot of uh, pretty sensitive information to, so we can get a feel for where you're at. And then the day of your ceremony, there's a small uh, survey that goes out before you ingest whatever, uh, the psilocybin. And then uh, the day after you get a small s- survey, and then two weeks after, and then a, a couple months after. So what that allows us is a really good look at before and after, right? Yeah. So. Uh, and then, and then again, it is, you know, a lot of questions on set and setting. Are you, are you doing this at a, at a concert? Are you doing this with a train facilitator underground on a couch individually? Are you doing this in a, with a group setting? All those things are really important to understand and know. I mean, 
um, as I'm sure you guys are aware, right. a psilocybin dose, you know, the same amount at a frat party is going to have a completely different effect if you're doing it uh, with, with a trained facilitator or with a community who's like there to do the work as well. So right. how can you take a substance that um, is the same overall, but then you change the setting and it, and it changes the magic. Everybody always says I did psilocybin in college. I don't, I don't get it. Why are all these people talking about how transformative it is? Yeah, you did it. Cause you were just, you know, rolling with it. Well, so. and yeah, we've gotten a lot of feedback like, Oh man, you talk about mushrooms, but like, I did this and I had like had a really bad trip and I'm like, Oh really? How much did you take? I don't know. <laughs> Where were you at a concert? Like crying, you know, <laughs> it's yep, like, yep. you know, those things, they matter. <laughs> so yep. we talk a lot about intention and dose and, you know, setting, setting and you know who you're with. Yeah, so. exactly. And, and that's the thing that we're, we're trying to do as far as uh, validate that. Yeah. Right. You know, a lot of, um, a lot of, studies are obviously clinical in nature and that's important very very important but i don't think the academic world and general world really understands how important intentions are settings are these types of things that uh we take for granted but um we're seeing it with these yeah. substances in particular like how important those things are yeah so with that study being wrapped up what did you um what were you able to take out of that that we can share with listeners so we're st- we're still in the middle of it you okay. know so we just we just ended it in june and this is this is data this is such robust data we we have done the largest uh real world study on psilocybin okay wow. so this data, we could pick at it for a very long time. What are we going to do with it? Well, I want to um, set up uh, a call center where people can understand, you know, we're going to see a story on CNN, the same way we did with cannabis, where with cannabis, it was a little girl having seizures, Charlotte Figgy from Charlotte's Web. That kind of changed the narrative for me personally. Uh, Marcus Capone is uh, a friend of mine who runs Vets. And I think Marcus's story is the type Incredible. of story that's going to make people say, oh, wow, that's crazy. You've got this 13 year combat veteran as red blooded an American as you could get, you know, just such a such a fantastic guy. Tell his story and people are going to say, wow, my uh, my son is struggling from PTSD for his from his time in Afghanistan. And if that if it works for that guy, it could work for my son. OK, well, where do you start, though? You right. know, one a question I I was at the Prop 122 watch party, and a question I was asking some of the most premier people who've been in this for a very long time. Hey, where do you send you know Great Aunt Rita when she wants to learn about how to use psilocybin? Where do you send her? Right? It's not like Earwad, right? right? Wonderful resource, incredible resource. They've been doing it way longer than us and whatnot. Yeah. But the the conversation in there is a little bit, you know not what great aunt Rita wants to hear. Right. So if we could have a resource center that is, um, community based, but academically led with stat, uh, statistical data to say, Hey, um, you call in, we'll pull the data that looks like what you've described as far as what you're intending to do. And guess what? We have four people who kind of like fit the bill there and this is what they did to have success. And guess what? This is what they did to have bad reactions. So Mm -hmm. here, here, here's what that data looks like. So um, that's one resource that I like to see our data be put forth. And then also um, one of the other venture or not ventures, one of the things I'm part of is the decrim nature uh, Boulder County steering committee. Yeah. I want to be able to take our data and I've testified in front of city council and say, you know, Hey, don't take my word for it. This is Johns Hopkins data. Here's some statistical data for you city council people to understand that this isn't a bunch of hippies in the crowd who are trying to, you know, free the spores. We're trying yeah. to do that, but not, <laughs> not that bad. Um, but provide them data that can resonate for them. Yeah. Right? And we are, so it's, sorry, go ahead. No, no, please. I, I ramble. I apologize. No, 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 that's okay. But I was just going to say, we are very much so a society where we, I think, um, have stereotyped and it's, it's gotten better, but stereotyped people who have been, you know, vocal about using psychedelics and people here want to see 
data and research and numbers and and proof on why this is beneficial. Um, stories do help, but it's it's the data that they want to see. Sure, and and we could provide. You know, my my goal and uh, one one desire with some funding would be data back storytelling. Yeah. We have these incredible anecdotal stories from maybe people you know and trust, whether it's a professional athlete or a musician or someone of that nature. And, you know, they, they say something and then we could put up a Johns Hopkins statistical uh, analysis above what they say and say, yeah, not only is, you know, for instance, Rashad saying this, it's actually kind of true, at least from the, the data that we've, we've done, you know, so there's, there's two there's two people to convince in, in this world, in my opinion, you've got uh, people who could be convinced with anecdotal stories where, again, you see a little, a little girl or a combat veteran struggling and you can relate. Okay. That's all I need. And that's all I needed. Yeah. You know, I, the, this trust the science thing is a little, we're, we're adhering to that a little bit too hard. Uh, I don't need Johns Hopkins to tell me that these are transformative experiences. Right. Um, but I absolutely appreciate and understand those who do, you yeah. know, and there is a lot of information that we do need to, to understand here. And so uh, the other person is someone who needs to hear it from the white coats, right? Someone in a lab coat to say, hey, here is uh, what is actually going on in these people's brains. They're telling you they're having some crazy whatever. Well, it's actually, you know, the 5H2TA receptor getting, you know, bombarded and ultimately it mimics serotonin. So it's a pretty safe thing. And yeah, they should be able to do this. It's, you know, schedule four drug, right? That would be, that would be a beautiful thing, but yeah. uh, t- two angles, people and white coats, you know? Yeah. I think I relate more to someone who's more relatable. Yeah. Like the science stuff, you know, I, I respect it. And sometimes it goes over my head. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I don't know. It just works. <laughs> Right. But my husband's more analytical, wants the answers, wants to see, you know, the data and and the ups and downs. Like, Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of people who prefer that. Um, I guess so for the call center, I think that that's like a really, really great idea, because what we're finding is a lot of people reaching out to us asking, where can I do this? Where can I where can I find this? And we know a lot of the underground space and we can't necessarily share that all the time. Um, So it kind of sucks because we're like, you can go this legal route, but you'd have to go here and you could go this legal route, but you have to be part of this clinical trial or you go to Jamaica. (laughs) Right. And that's what I say as far as, you know, I mean, Johns Hopkins has been doing this since 2000. Okay. And I don't know exactly what this number is, so I should be careful when I say it, but you know, I, I would say, and I think it's probably less than this, but let's just say, you know, a thousand people have been able to go through their clinical trials. Let's say, and I think that's a pretty strong number. There's a thousand people tripping right now, right now. They are tripping and they've taken mushrooms and like, so the way that people are going to approach this, chances are it's not going to be on a couch at Johns Hopkins. Right. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So how do we how do we make sure, though, that they have um, the right resources for harm reduction? Right? right. So that's what hopefully we can do. How did you get into this space? Because I know, you know, your work with Charlotte's Web. But how did you yeah. get into the psychedelic space? Uh, yeah. So I was uh, when, when I first started with Charlotte's Web, you know, I was against cannabis maybe eight years ago, Same. eight or nine years ago now. What? Like, yeah. <laughs> See, I'm telling you guys, it's the gateway drug. <laughs> it is. It really uh, is. But in a different 100%. way than what most people think. Yeah. yeah. I say it all the time. Cannabis is the gateway drug to all the bullshit they've been feeding us. Yes. You know I mean? So, and that's just it. That's what it's like. That's kind of what, like, you told me all this shit about cannabis and now you're saying the same things about mushrooms. Now it's like, I, I have to do them now. Well, right. yeah, and then when I started taking cannabis, I was like, hold up, what's the problem? Yeah, what else have they told me that is bad? Yeah, and that- I, you know, it's not, I, I didn't have an issue with cannabis. I, I got it in my, like, because I smoked it and I've done it multiple times even before I was, like, against it. But, you know, it's just uh, weeds for losers. You don't yeah. do anything. You just sit around on a couch. All the while drinking my ass off. Right. Right. 
with, you know, uh, a legal celebrated statistically most dangerous drug in the world, alcohol, right. more dangerous than anything else. And that's a fact. That's not a, that's not a hippie's opinion. Um, <laughs> I agree with that. Yep. But seeing, uh, I, I bought a, I bought a, um, th- this is actually kind of interesting. I bought a property in Longmont, Colorado. I had a couple acres on it and apple trees. And I, and I've always loved gardening. My grandparents have big gar- farms in uh, Michigan. And, uh, so I had a friend who's like, man, you, you talk so much about food because I had read Michael Pollan's book, the omnivores dilemma, not how to change your mind, the omnivores dilemma. And I was thinking, dang, like food is, I didn't really know that about the food space. I didn't know it was, you know, so mass produced and all, all the things that are in that really wonderful book. So I've always loved Michael Pollan. And then, uh, so that, that's what kind of led me to that because then a friend said, you talk all this smack about, you know, a tomato being so whatever, but you think that weed is, you know, the devil's lettuce. How do you not understand that this is medicine, you know, and if you could grow your own in your garden and, and, and I said, okay. So I started looking into it and then I saw the kids having seizures um, that were put together by like the realm of caring. Uh, so Charlotte Figgy, little girl having seizures, CNN, Dr. Sanjay Gupta ran that story. The uh, woman who started that page, Charlotte's mom, she started that with my co-founder, Heather Jackson, whose son Zakai is the second person to ever take Charlotte's Web. They started the realm of caring and they started Charlotte's Web with, with the brothers as well. And uh, going to their facility and seeing the moms there, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pretty conservative person. I'm an ultra conservative libertarian kind of person. And I was thinking, dang, if the government was trying to stop me from giving my child this super safe medicine, I, I would, I would be in prison. So, uh, the, the mentality shift of like just educating myself and understanding that I'm a big part of the problem, you know, because I've got this Ooh. strong opinion about cannabis and I don't know shit about it. And now what I'm starting to say now is like in the day of, in the age of information, like we have now, ignorance is a choice. Now, if you're against psychedelics, you are choosing to not educate yourself, period period. It's, it's that simple. So, uh, cannabis is the same way. So this work now is atonement. So while I was working for Charlotte's web during that period of time, I had a, I was invited to a, uh, five MEO ceremony and I'd never done, I'd done psilocybin when I was 18, uh, never really had any psychedelic experiences. And then I, I did that. And that was November 11th. Uh, so I just had my, my birthday just the other day. And, uh, that was years ago. And when that happened, um, it was just so crystal clear that this was my life's work. So, um, that's how I got involved in, in psychedelics. And then, uh, in that I saw Kevin Matthews who ran Decrim Denver and prop 122 that just passed. He was trying to get mushrooms on the ballot. This is in 2018. And I was like, whatever I could do to help you, man, I'm, I'm here. So I, I became the outreach director for Decrim Dem. And while doing that and totally seeing that psychedelics are going to come into the mainstream, I thought back to the realm of caring when these moms had no resources to help their kids having seizures. They had a community of uh, uh, parents who were coming together and saying, hey, what are you giving your kid? I don't know, 25 milligrams and, and we're on these pharmaceuticals and, and what are you giving your kid? Well, I'm giving them a hundred milligrams and, and 10 of THC or whatever that is. Right. And like, they're, they're just kind of going back and forth in a community way of like what's working, what's inducing seizures, what's stopping seizures, all those things. Heather Jackson, my founder understood, uh, or my co-founder in unlimited sciences, she understood we need to have data around this. So yeah. who did she reach out to? Johns Hopkins. So Johns Hopkins was the, the source that started collecting their uh, cannabis data. And that's who Unlimited Sciences ultimately leaned into. We said, hey, you want us to do the same thing for psilocybin? And they saw that data and they're analyzing. Yeah, heck yeah, we do. Yeah, so that, that's how that kind of had come about as far as my, my involvement in psychedelics and what kind of drove my um, need to be in this because it's 100% changed my life in, in a way that's like 
I, I remember the day I did five and it was like, Ooh. wow, this is, this, this is what I've been looking for my entire life. Yeah. And all it was, it wasn't the medicine. It was just a deep knowing of who I am and what, what this is and the freaking blessing it is to breathe deeply, to engage in life and be connected with yourself because we are all so incredibly powerful. I'm like, Oh, I was just looking for myself. I just didn't know who I was. Yeah. You know? So. Well, and it's like what what Jimmy, our interview guest said, he said, you know, at the end of the day, you are your own guide. The mushrooms or whatever psychedelic is a tool, but it's just helping you come home to yourself. That's what it does, which is incredible. Totally. It seems like that's kind of, um, so for those who don't know, 5-MeO-DMT, um, that is, that's toad, right? Like that's the bufo? Yes. Okay. Yep. It's uh, 5-methoxy-dimethyltryptamine. Just to be 100% clear, it is way different than dimethyltryptamine, DMT. Yes. Everybody always talks about, oh, I've done that. No. <laughs> really have you? And then if you know whether they have or they haven't, because if you've done it, you know you've done it, and you know how to say five methoxy dimethyltryptamine. <laughs> if you if you've hit a vape pen at a concert and you did dimethyltryptamine, you probably you know get them confused. But there's no confusion between the two. Very same physiological experience, but uh, very very different chemical. Well, and there's also I, I've been seeing a lot of stuff lately, and I know it's happened before. Vice did um, an episode about the bufo toad years ago, and all of a sudden people are like going and licking these toads, and it's that same like just educate yourself because that is not how it's done. <laughs> but people no. hear something, and I think that that's the thing too. That's why it's so important to talk about this. You know, people will hear something about a psychedelic helping. And instead of like understanding it or researching it or reading into it or asking questions, there's like they take kind of matters into their own hand and they'll go and they'll do eight grams on their own and have no idea what the fuck they're doing. And and I think that that's a huge part of it, too. Just the awareness, the education around it, being curious about it, you know, wanting to learn from people who have kind of walked through those things and, and learning from them. Yeah. Um. I don't know why I went on that tangent, but the toad thing really like messes me up how people are still like just going out licking toads. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm actually in Arizona right now in the, the, uh, division of wildlife people are out there, uh, licking toads and it's, it's crazy. And that's just it too. I think the one thing to really convey to people is like, while these are very transformative experiences, uh, the toad is hugely in decline. Amphibians are such a sensitive uh, uh, species, period. They've already been on the decline and now they're getting absolutely smoked by all the people who want to go out and capture toads and milk them and do, the, and do the thing. I just want to state to everybody who's listening, if you do toad, do the synthetic, okay, mm. period. And, and, and these, these any, anybody who's going to say, oh, but it's not natural, that's the kind of bullshit that I just want to forearm shiver someone. Yeah. This is not one of the areas where you um, can talk that bullshit because at the end of the day, the experience is so ineffable. You're not going to understand whether there was bufatine in it or not, right? So if you are adamant about doing what currently is the Mount Everest of psychedelics, please, for the love of the toads, and you will understand the love of the toads once you experience this, please, dear God, find a synthetic source which is absolutely as powerful okay so um that's something that that education piece yeah. conservation around these these uh these plants and fungi and, and uh animal medicines you got to know where the shit's coming from right you know that's kind of the same with mescaline right now you know it takes 10 years for a single plant to grow so people like running out trying to do this like in this situation synthetic is the better option and I don't know there's I know there's a lot of um controversy around even the synthetic mescaline side of that we don't have to get into that but well but but mescaline is one chemical inside a lot of these plants and you know you're referring necessarily to like peyote which is like 20 years for a mature button but wachuma san pedro the cactuses, you would be amazed the amount of cactuses that are psychedelic and contain 
mescaline and various other things. Wachuma, a very, very sustainable source of mescaline. Oh. If you want to experience uh, peyote, uh, um, if you're a white Westerner such as myself, do, do San Pedro, see what it's like, um, because that's, that's a pretty um, important medicine to a very vulnerable population of people, Native Americans. Uh, I've never done peyote. I don't, I don't have the right to, in my humble opinion. Yeah. Uh, so I can't speak directly to it, but from what I've understood, I have done Wachuma, I've done San Pedro, and I've been told it's uh, uh, similar enough that um, if you're absolutely called to peyote after doing that multiple times and building a relationship with uh, more of an indigenous collective who's going to allow you to do it, do that. But uh, yeah, these things are sensitive. Yeah, they're sacred. And um, I th- also think that with all of the th- psychedelics, there needs to be respect for the medicine. 100% like respect for the culture, the indigenous cultures around it. And, you know, it's different with, I think, like psilocybin. You can do the synthetic version, but also you can just, like, they grow <laughs> literally. Oh, yeah. So, anywhere. Anyway, that's the, the beauty. I mean, um, ayahuasca is a very important uh, plant medicine to me. The, the vines take about seven years to mature before you could harvest them. So, but I'm, I'm, really a believer that psilocybin is so underrated it is so underrated people talk about ayahuasca and they i think there's a you know some exotic aspect to it uh foreign aspect to it but i think if we start approaching psilocybin in the same kind of um uh, approach that we have to ayahuasca it's for me, honestly, it's more, I've had way more powerful experience. I've done ayahuasca quite a bit. Um, but I think that psilocybin, if done correctly, is just hands down, uh, a more powerful, fulfilling deal. And it takes a month to grow it, you know, two months to grow it. It's very, very sustainable. So I'd, I'd love to see people, um, work with that more, more often, much more accessible yeah. too. for, for the listeners that we have who are, they want the data and the research about psilocybin. What is some input that you can give about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, we're going to start publishing data here soon. We hope that our website will act as a resource where you could find some stats. Um, I am, actually speaking with David Bronner today to kind of discuss what we're up to and see if there's any uh, way to, um, I'd, I'd like a call center with like Fireside, if you're familiar yes, with Fireside. Yeah, we yeah. have Fireside. There, Josh uh, White started that. Uh, and it's a really great resource for people who are uh, uh, looking to understand post experience. And that's where I kind of have a little hiccup. Well, let's get them before that. You know, yeah. it's preventative work, not symptom work. So, uh, and what I'd love to see is some level of a collaboration there to then have a, you know, resource for people to, to, to look into these things, but hopefully we'll have some data that people could analyze and understand, uh, here soon. But yeah, it's tough because that, and that's what I'm saying. Like, where, where do you send someone to find a right. really wholesome place? And I've been doing this for years. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I like people ask me all the time. Like, I don't know. You're on your own. You know, like I, I just don't want to be, I don't want to be that person to provide uh, a resource to that because um, the more I involve myself in this, the less I know. And I see the opposite for a lot of people. They, they do psilocybin three or four times and they're a fucking shaman now. And it, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy for me because I, you're messing with people's souls. You know, it's a very spiritual thing that I don't think we as Westerners really understand, honestly. And so to want to um, hold that, I think it takes a special person and I am absolutely not that person. <laughs> Self-aware. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I know we've talked about a little bit about um, psychedelics and, and, and psychedelic mushrooms. Um, you also are part of Umbo or is it Umbo? Umbo. Umbo. Um, which yeah. is functional mushrooms, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I started Umbo. Umbo, just so you know, it's the, it's the word for the very top of a mushroom cap. <gasps> you know, the little top. That's what an Umbo is. Oh my God, I didn't oh. know that. 
Yeah. I, I learn that. something new every interview. Yeah. And you yeah. do this so, with uh, Jake Plummer and Rashad Evans, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, Jake Plummer and I worked at Charlotte's Web together. Mm-hmm. Um, for those who don't know, obviously, he's an NFL quarterback for the Cardinals and the Broncos and Arizona State um, when he was in college. And uh, Rashad Evans is a former light heavyweight champ, just was inducted in the Hall of Fame of the UFC. Uh, really just a, a brother of mine. Uh, the three of us started Umbo because uh, we're trying to fund unlimited sciences. We're trying to do mm. some corporate social responsibility and give back to um, unlimited sciences in a way that we could be a little bit more sustainable there. And we could, we could set up that resource for people. So I could say, yeah, Hey, there's tons of data at our website. There's tons of videos. There's a call center, all those types of things. And so, we're trying to use Umbo as a, um, a resource for that. So, yeah. So what kind of products do you have? So again, working with functional mushrooms, uh, just so the audience is clear, I kind of put mushrooms in categories and this isn't definitive for all of them, but you have gourmet mushrooms. That's what most people are used to pizza, portobello, those types. <laughs> Functional mushrooms are kind of the weird ones that people have been used, using for thousands of years, especially in uh, uh, Asian cultures. You have, uh, you know, reishi, turkey tail, cordyceps. These are kind of necessarily, you need an extraction process to get out there, their, what, what's bioavailable, what the good um, aspects of these mushrooms are. And so that's like your functional mushroom group. Uh, and then you have as, as psilocybin legislation continues to move forward, you'll have medicinal mushrooms, which are going to be psilocybin containing mushrooms. So gourmet, functional, um, medicinal. And again, lion's mane, for instance, can live in all three categories. Lion's mane is delicious. It's very much a functional mushroom. And since it is, it's very medicinal. So that's just a little education on it, but we're, we're, uh, our products are functional mushrooms. We have functional mushroom bars that have like, you know, two and a half grams of mushrooms in it. Uh, we have capsules, uh, Michael Rise and Michael Rest. These are energy focused for Michael Rise and uh, sleep focused for Michael Rest. And then we just launched a brand new line of tinctures that are alcohol free. Most tinctures, to, to be uh, uh, correct in terminology, a tincture actually needs alcohol in it. That's what a tincture is. But we've done alcohol as an extraction process, one of three extraction processes on these mushrooms, but we've removed the alcohol because Rashad is like, you know, I don't, I don't want to do a shot in the morning. I don't like alcohol (laughs) taste in the morning if I'm going to be doing lion's mane to start my day. And so, so we have, um, uh, lion's mane, reishi, turkey tail and cordyceps. And then we have a blend of eight mushrooms that we use as an immunity blend. So that's where we're at with that, that, uh, offering right now. And we're, we're stoked to be um, engaging in that because I, as I've dove into functional mushrooms, I believe functional mushrooms have as much, if not more potential to help humanity than psilocybin. It's a bold mm. statement from someone who's been so involved in psilocybin. I know the power of psilocybin to a, a good degree, but lion's mane, reishi turkey tail there are compounds inside these mushrooms that we're we're you know psilocybin is that shiny object right now so if we kind of put that uh that effort into these legal functional mushrooms i think we would see um really tremendous health results for um people yeah i think there's a lot of um not misinformation, just not a lot of education around functional mushrooms. You know, I have people trying to wean off antidepressants. I'm not saying I do. I don't just friends like trying to wean off antidepressants because their anxiety is so bad, but won't try functional mushrooms to like help calm them down or can't sleep, but won't try functional mushrooms to like help them go to sleep. Or, you know, that's, that's kind of what's, um, I'm like, you know, if you take some lion's mane in the morning, you right. could, you could increase your energy and your focus. And they're like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. So just Mm -hmm. some, I'm like, we drink mushroom coffee in the mornings, you know, they, I really think this is a bold statement too. It's not, you're right. It's not just the psychedelic mushrooms. I really think mushrooms can change a lot, a lot in the world. Well, and it, that's just it. That's what it's, you know, bioremediation textiles, right? Like 
the obviously fantastic fungi being a fantastic film to watch if you want to understand the potential of these mushrooms. Uh, but people have got to start taking their health in their own hands. It's kind of what I say to Jake is Good point. Um, the goal with Umbo. It's not necessary for you to take mushrooms. It's just to kind of say, wow, you know, there's a lot of options out here. What maybe it's breath work, maybe it's ice baths, maybe it's sauna, maybe it's CrossFit, maybe it's yoga, maybe it's psilocybin. But at the end of the day, it's kind of like, hey, guess what? There's there's some really incredible things out there. After I did five, I had a friend introduce me to breath work. I'd never done breath work before. And I, I was so disappointed that I did not have that experience beforehand to understand holy shit, shit, just by breathing in a unique way, I could induce the most wild exp- psychedelic experience in the world. Yeah. For all your listeners who are in, in psychedelics and, and want to have an experience like that, do breath work first. Go to a facilitator who knows what they're doing and just see this power is from within. You have the ability to induce wild states and healing on your own. Uh, and it's, you know, time for people to take their health back on their own hands and we just need resources to educate because I didn't know that. How do you learn about breath work? I didn't know that either. And and Leah has done a full session, but I did a 15 minute session and I was like, holy fuck. <laughs> How could I do an hour of this? This was wild. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of work, huh? <laughs> it's it's uh challenging for sure. Well it's like that's legal, guys. Like right. it's it's totally. breathing. Right. Right. But I've said the same thing after my first like full session. I was like, holy shit, that was the most psychedelic thing I've ever done. (laughs) Well, and, and, you know, that was uh, discovered by Stanislav Grof, you know, the LS, the famous LSD researcher who was uh, back in the 50s watching his patients come down from LSD, but then get excited and start breathing again. And then they'd go back into this wild experience. And then, and then when they shut down that research, he started holotropic breathing, you know? I did not so, know that. Yeah. I love that. Full of info. <laughs> Full of info. Yep. Okay. I have yep. a question and I'm going to take it back to unlimited sciences because I didn't get to ask this. So I'm kind of a little bit bummed that the study's over and I didn't know about it <laughs> until recently. I'm like, dang it. I could have participated or helped in some way. Um, however, I want to know if you guys are planning on doing that same type of research model or, um, data searching for other substances like MDMA or possibly, um, you know, I know you're doing a little bit with ayahuasca, but, but what else is there or LSD, you know? Yeah. So hundred percent on that. We, we have already, laid out the general registry is what we're calling it. And the general registry would include all these other substances, right? 5-MeO. How are people using 5-MeO? How are people using ayahuasca? How are people using, uh, we're, we're excluding MDMA because that work is on its way. We don't need to, you know, do that. Naturally occurring substances is what we're looking towards, but the fact of the matter is these things cost so much money, you know, they, they really do. And, uh, people don't, our studies aren't sexy immediately because they're longitudinal and, Mm. uh, people don't fully understand them. But I think that once we start publishing our data on the psilocybin registry, people will start to understand what we've been trying to do first. And they'll start saying, Oh, I, I get it now. I understand why that's so valuable. We need that for ayahuasca. We need that for Ibogaine. We need that for 5-MeO, you know? So um, we, we hope to launch that, but again, that's a, that's a, that's a spendy venture. We're a hundred percent volunteer right now. Um, oh, wow. And okay. we uh, are really focused and working on uh, the, the uh, Johns Hopkins data that we have. So then we can say, see people, this is why this is important. Do you want to validate community use? You know, everybody talks, I mean, I'm part of these decrim nature movements. I'm part of this community led movement stuff. If you really care, then, then we've got to uh, speak their language. Right. And yeah. we've got to validate how people are using these things. And, and this is the only way I know how to do it. Well, and since you guys are nonprofit, um, people can, if they want to help. And since 
the study is kind of over with right now, they can donate. Absolutely. And let me just say the what we've been able to do with the small funds that we've received from outside donors, and uh, this has been pretty much 100% funded by Heather Jackson, uh, we can do amazing things. We have such a tremendous network of people who want to help us. Uh, the what I would be able to do with twenty five thousand dollars, no other nonprofit would be able to. I one hundred percent believe that, and that that would be you know videos with uh, well known people who can speak to why this stuff's important, and then ultimately raise more funds to uh, make more change. So unlimitedsciences.org is where people could you know learn more about. We're we're revamping our website on Umbo just provided a little bit of funds to unlimited sciences to revamp our, our website. Um, and we want to be more clear about what we do. We've done a, we've done a bad job of, of like kind of being crystal clear about who we are and what we do. So, uh, we, we, we got taught a lesson recently. We did a PR deal and, uh, well, honestly, double blind magazine, I reached out, to see if they do a story and, and they did and that was in the right spirit but they straight up did a clickbait title that oh. said you know study to give uh saudi refugees ayahuasca and it, it made it sound like we're pinning people down in tents on the border pouring ayahuasca down their throat and we got so much shit for it you know uh little did people know if they would have read further down that malik who's a brother of mine who worked at charlotte's web he wants to validate his community of Arab people's work in this space. Hey, I know the only way to really do that is if we have statistical data. Right. So can you guys help us capture this? Because I'm doing this with or without you. I'm hosting this ayahuasca circle with or without unlimited sciences. But if you guys would come and sit and observe, um, you know, maybe we could provide data to help more people like him move forward with what, what they'd like to see. And so, um, we got bad, we got some bad press. Uh, people can't read beyond the freaking headline. They don't yeah. dig in any further. And so we kind of realized, well, our website's kind of shit. It doesn't really convey what we're trying to do. And so we're, we're trying to be better, but again, man, this is all volunteer. This is, uh, this is a passion project. And, uh, I, I, I get, I take things very personally. It's the one for agreement that I don't to <laughs> at all. The one for uh, agreement. Yeah, one of the four agreements. That's a hard I, one. I it is a hard one. <laughs> I also struggle hard. with this. <laughs> Especially when, you know, I've, I've spent so much time on the decred right. aspect of this and I'm, I, I know where my heart lies and I, I'm trying to do, um, the best I can and, and, the, and write by the people because I, I want people to take their health back in their own hands. And when you have the same community you're trying to help call you a, a racist piece of shit, you know, it's like, Oh, okay, cool. I really enjoy that. You know? So yeah, thanks guys. Yeah. Thanks people. Well, and I think um, <laughs> what's incredible is that like, I think that in this space, you know, everybody is, we're all still human. We're going to make mistakes and, the, you know, we can learn from them. But um, I think anybody in this space, not everybody, but a lot of people are really out there to try to help. And, and it kind of totally. takes away from that when, when you're hearing something from someone else who has no idea so yeah, I get. I would take it personal too. It would be hard not to, right? <laughs> yeah, it's really hard not to. Yeah, um, I mean, we appreciate everything that you guys are doing. I, I mean, I love your website, <laughs> but also like I know where you guys are and what you're doing. Um, we share a lot of your posts, and we did that before we knew who you were. So I was like, hold up, wait, I know unlimited sciences. You know, you you all have. I don't know if you have anything to do with the social media side of it, but you know, sharing like celebrity stories and their positive stories is huge. Well, and that's the thing too, is like, there's so much gatekeeping, you know, here we've seen uh, with, with Colorado in particular, you know, prop 122 being put forth, which um, living in two worlds of understanding the, the total need to legalize this in a, in a way like grandma's not coming to a drum circle. She needs to sit on a couch with a therapist and a medical model yeah. and we have to usher that in. But I've always stated decrim first, nothing comes before decriminalization. 
sp speaking to cannabis people here in Arizona, they're talking about all these things they want to do. I'm like, where, where's your, where can you point me to the, your decrim team? You guys yeah. are, you guys are trying to build the, you know, roof before you even put down the foundation, Ooh. you know, it aggravates me, but, um, uh, prop 122 had so much opposition from within and that's, and that's right. Fully. So in the sense, like we've got to have community, we've got to have dialogue and, and, uh, from some of that first initial dialogue, they actually changed some of the language of what they were putting forth, but the amount of people who are, you know, you got to get through me before you can do anything. It's like, no, this is, this is, uh, we, we need to, um, I don't know. There seems to be a lot of egos in the psychedelic oh. space. If you, uh, <laughs> uh, one of our next studies, the next study I want to do is ego inflation. Yeah. You know, everybody's talking about this ego dissolution. I'm like, bullshit, bullshit. I see people use these things. The next thing you know, they're floating around. Ego like my, my first experience on, on five MEO. I mean, and, and this is a, this is an honest truth that people may experience, but I, I absolutely felt I was the Christ. And I know that that's a, that's a difficult thing for people to hear, but it was this like, Oh my God, I've been brought here to save the people. And, and when I, was coming out of it. It was a deep realization. Like, you know, you're not, you're, you're a regular guy and like, please adhere to that guy. Um, but it's just, again, that understand we all are Christ. We all have Christ consciousness. We all have such a, a beauty within us that we don't tap into. And that was the first time I ever did it. So it made it feel like, Oh, I'm unique. I'm not unique. Everybody's this way. But I wonder how many people have that same experience because they do. This is a very common experience for a lot of people is a, is a Christ consciousness or um, Christ like whatever. But when do they start getting honest with themselves that, no, you're still Dell, you're still a regular guy. You still have to conform. No one's going to worship you. Yeah. You know, there's some dangers in these um, substances sometimes in the sense of making you think something that's not not true. But I'd love to study the amount of people who kind of start to adhere to that because I see it all the time. Yeah. They're, they're We've talked gatekeepers. about that. Well, I've seen too, I've recently read something, you know, a lot of people think that this would help a lot of narcissists. And then there's mm. these other side that's like, or it would make them worse. <laughs> like it would make mm. them bigger narcissists. Yeah. Well, well that's I, just yeah. it is you have a substance that, uh, the only people who are, are, super knowledgeable the majority of people are super knowledgeable in it are cut from a cloth that is willing to do illegal things right so they're already kind of a different mentality yeah is what i would say and so um that's why it's very very easy to have a bunch of shit life coaches who you know have been microdosing and they are you know providing information because they're just willing to speak about it right they might not know anything at all, really. They just have had a few great experiences. And now they're they're an authority, and they are an authority amongst a bunch of people who've never done this before, right? Who know nothing, right? Yeah. So, so uh, we've got to do a better job of. I mean, at the end of the day, like you said, you're your own guide. You've got it on. Like, how do you feel about this person, right? Like, you've got to. It's on you to do your homework and know what's up and what's safe and all that kind of stuff because. The, I've, I've sat with facilitators that are terrible, awful human beings. And then you realize it after the, after your experience, like, Oh my God, who, who allowed you to do this? You're a piece of shit. You know, they are a dime a dozen here in this, in uh, the facilitating world. And you get, you know, into a scenario where, you, Oh, I've got this one opportunity to five, do five MEO DMT. I don't know when this is ever going to happen. I don't care who the hell serves it to me. You know, my dad's an art dealer and he talks about the art world is very dangerous. There's a lot of um, cutthroat stuff that happens. It's, and there's one particular guy. I'm like, why do people still buy art from him? He's like, you don't understand. It's art. It's the, it's the only piece of art that there is. If you have a Monet and it's the only one, you'll buy that from Satan himself, you know, because I want that piece of art, right? I don't care who, I'm not buying the person who's selling it to me, but I don't know how you got it or all that kind of, I just want the art, you know? So that's, that's an, another reason why decriminalization and uh, legalization will validate this stuff. Cause it starts, you know, washing out some of these people who are doing things underground and illegal and they're the only game in town. So you got to kind of adhere to their bullshit and their egos. I didn't even think about it like that. 
Well, You're absolutely right. Well, and we recently had somebody message us that um, they participated in an ayahuasca ceremony in Kentucky. And, you know, the medicine did what it needed to do for him and himself. But the, sh- the shaman was, he said, awful, god awful. So it was interesting to hear that perspective. But yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you look at um, Octavio Redding who is, uh, was one of the first people to be serving 5-MEO. And he's a doctor and all this shit. And he puts videos out there. The guy's garbage. And I hope you hear this. You know, <laughs> wow. he's, he's a piece of trash. He's got people uh, having these very profound experiences and he's kicking them on the ground or waterboarding them or telling them, oh, he shows yes. this, you know, I'm like. That kind of sounds and, like cover story I shit. I was just going to bring, I don't know if you've listened to cover story, that podcast. Um, where people are speaking about their psychedelic experiences, but getting like while they were in their experience, getting essentially sexually assaulted and raped during their experience and how traumatizing Absolutely. that was. And, you know, how do you, how do you recover from something like that? Yeah. That was supposed to be healing and, you know, so a that very space. much is a thing that happens for sure. Absolutely. Unfortunately. Absolutely. Yeah. There is, um, there are so many examples and stories of uh, people being taken advantage of during these during these um, very ineffable experiences, and that's why you know uh, you've got to have some level of legalization mm. so we can vet some of these people. Yeah, you know, it's mm. it's it's really scary what um, what goes on in this world. There's there's some huge names. Uh, that are thought leaders in this or were thought leaders in this, then they, they talk about stories like, what, what are you doing? Are you out of your mind? You know? So I always state, if you're, if you're new to this and you're going to do this, I'm going to do this, go with friends or someone who's with you. Don't be alone with someone. If you have to do it and you, what, and if they can't adhere to that, if they're not down with having your friend there holding your hand and that's something you need, then they're not the right person for you. I mean, there's, there's so much to, to vet when you're about to enter in quite honestly, the most profound states of experience. Um, and it's, it's, it's complicated, very complicated scenario. Yeah. But even this is like very educational to our listeners for sure. We don't want to just uh, talk about the fluffy, good stuff like, no. oh, you take this and you're good and you're healed and, you know, no, there yeah. needs to be a lot it's, of education that goes with it, too. Yep. Pre pre and post work. Post work so important. Um, you know, that's that's where the magic happens. That's where uh, healing and progress happens is what is your plan after this? Otherwise, you're just doing an experience, mm-hmm. you know, and if you don't have a a plan or so in, in the loneliness that you could feel after these experiences. When I first did this, I came back to my wife and I was just like, what, how do I, what am I going to do here now? Like, yeah. I love my wife, but she doesn't get it. And she thinks I'm crazier than I already am. I've always <laughs> been crazy, but now I'm even more crazy. Yeah. And um, I know that it was really important. One of the next times I went to do it, I said, to my wife, I, I need you to be here. I need you to understand what's going on because if you, if you can't, it, it won't last. I just know it won't because I feel so lonely and there's, there's no one to talk to. And I'm sure I don't, I don't mean to, uh, stereotype, but coming from the South, I, I don't assume there's a ton of people in your community that you have, you know, large groups where you could kind of be, and maybe you do. And I apologize. For no, no, we don't. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah. there are very, very, few and far between. And I think we both kind of experienced the same thing after our first, um, trip, you know, not feeling like we were being understood. And for me, especially like my spouse, at the, you know, I said at the time, he's still my husband, <laughs> but, <laughs> but feeling very lonely and, and I can't talk to him about any of this. And now I can thankfully, but you know, same with friends and just feeling like very isolated and, we're starting to build um, kind of, I've, I'm just going to say it. I feel like we're building our own little community mm-hmm. in a way. Yeah. It's, it's, well, yeah, you, yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, friends will drop off for sure. Oh, right. I mean, it's so, 
it's crystal clear. Yeah, I mean, we're weird now, <laughs> right? We're we're kind of stereotyped as woo woo, and you know, people have have said like, oh, I can't associate with you because you do drugs. And I'm like, well, you do drugs too. You drink alcohol, and uh, we could get into this whole debate, but you know, but it's it's um. You know, the downside is is you changing and having inner peace, but you losing people who you essentially still love um, and care for. But it's like they're not down with this version of you. Um, they're like, yeah, no, go ahead. And so that part has been very hard and we've been very authentic and, and vocal about that. That's it's been challenging. Yeah. Well, and time time will tell. You know what I mean? It's already started. This is, I, I believe the psychedelic movement is going to happen faster than, than cannabis. I think people are, uh, we're so sick of all the bullshit. And we all, I say like, you know, like when you're a little kid, the world is your oyster and you feel this, you feel this emotion of like, oh man, I'm like, these are good. You yeah, know, right. I'm playing with a blade of grass and I'm looking at an animal and you've got this childlike wonderment. This brings that back, that awareness back. Yeah dang, I, I want that. And, and people are looking for it. They don't know what it is. Right. You know, they, 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 and again, it's just a deep knowing of who you are and, and what you are, but uh, yeah, you'll lose friends, but I, I'd assume some of them will come back. It's, 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 um, I just it had is that. what it's supposed to be. Yeah. I just had a friend kind of come back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> which is like beautiful you know mm-hmm. kind of saying the same thing like you were right all along and I'm like I've been saying this <laughs> Yep. anyway so I feel yep. like that's like probably a good takeaway you know um we usually ask our listener or our guests you know what their biggest takeaway from psychedelics has been that they are willing to share um with our listeners uh I feel like you said it but if there's anything else like what's your biggest takeaway yeah. I mean, I, I think that is, I think it's just, uh, just a reconnection to myself. Right. And just a, uh, a deep knowing of this wonderful opportunity. We get to be human and experience this. And, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for plants and animal and fungi medicine for just kind of showing me how tremendous this opportunity is to breathe air and, have children and swim in pools and be physical and take a nap and all these, these uh, human experiences that we get to have on the daily. And so I'm, I'm just uh, that my takeaway is just the gratitude that I now have for life that definitely has been beaten out of me Uh, in that time period. Everybody just kind of has a things get hard. And so uh, deep gratitude that these things have found me and um, let me kind of open my eyes to the potential that there is. Love that. Yeah. You're awesome. And you're doing, you know, great work in this community and we appreciate it. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing with us too. And, you know, we'll keep our listeners posted on these studies when you guys release them. We'll share you guys. Yeah. If they just, uh, our unlimited sciences, Instagram is where we've got, most of our communication and following will start hopefully in the next few months start just inundating folks with some really powerful data to help uh, usher this in in a responsible way. We're excited to share. And I'm so excited about the call, the call center. I know. Yeah. We'll, we'll stay on track with that too. That's much, yeah. much needed in this space. So. Yeah. Thank you. I hope, I hope we can get that lifted off here in the coming years uh, because I think it's every day it's more and more necessary. Thank you, Dell. And for all of our listeners, we'll, we'll plug Dell and Unlimited Sciences and Umbo, and we'll give you all the information you need, and we will see you guys on the other side.